a couple weeks ago for one of my courses yeah. and he was like yeah it doesn't have to be like your five paragraph structure or whatever just you know write a write an essay how you would want to write it and i was like all right got it and then i just kind of like I found myself kind of following the same format that you did because I had to write about like a specific <laughs> like show or movie or book or whatever. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah, uh, okay. Well, I've got a couple like supporting points. I've got a couple quotes that I can use because I had to use quotes. Yeah. And then I just kind of went through like, yep, this is why it's great. And uh, here's some really interesting things about it. And then also, you know, it's just great. And I got a good mark on it. So, so. you basically <laughs> wrote an episode of This Is A Thing. I basically did. Welcome. You are entering into a strange dimension. A dimension where narratives from across space and time come together. Narratives that could have, might have, or should have been all exist here in one space. This is Cinemasters Ultimate Timeline. Welcome back to Cinemasters. This is the show where we or podcast or whatever it is that you're listening to or watching where we uh, watch movies or do video games or whatever and then we pitch them back to one another to see if we can make them changed or better or talk about what we liked and didn't like and this week we are doing the 2004 I think movie Ella Enchanted starring Anne Hathaway and I am of course joined by one of the Cinemasters crew uh, Alyssa hello <laughs> And so, yeah, Ella Enchanted. Um, I mean, how many times have you seen this movie? Or was this the first time? And what are your thoughts? I've probably watched it too many times. Oh, yeah. Um, for what fan. it is. Well, it's just a goofy movie to watch. And if it's on TV, I'll watch it. Yeah. But other than that, I don't tend to go seeking out Anne Hathaway as Ella because it just. <laughs> It's a very strange movie. Yeah, this movie is, is aesthetically really weird because I was watching it and I was like, this movie, I know it came out in the early 2000s, but it's it feels very 90s. It does, yeah. yeah. It has this very 90s feel. Do you remember the 90s? Are you old enough for that? I do not remember the 90s, <laughs> no, but I do remember like the early, early 2000s because I was... That's when I was just, you know, starting to remember things, I guess. I would have been like four oh, in that's 2000. In 2001, you were four? Yeah. I was nine. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I this movie is, uh, I liked it. And yet, um, yeah, you're right. It's sort of this, like, feel-good movie. I think this is the second time I've seen it. It's just goofy and fun to yeah. watch, but also a little cringy at the same time. Yeah, it does have that, that but, like, a feel-good cringe. You're not, like, like terrible movie cringe. Like, mm -hmm. it has this sort of feel-good where you're like, oh. Like, that's so dumb, but okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any other way to explain that. That's um, exactly that's exactly how it is. It's just, yeah, that's really dumb, but okay. But it's also not like a, yeah. ew, like that's awful yeah, kind like, of oh, dumb. Oh, why would you do that? Just, yeah. Um, I really did enjoy, like I said, the aesthetic. Not just the 90s aesthetic, but also that they're clearly trying to be like, it's a fairy tale, but it feels like it's set in like modern day. Or at least the but 90s. But also... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like Yeah, it, but also they somehow have it in, like, castles. And yeah, it's but, like, so the strange. castles have, like, elevators and escalators. And the language they're using is, like, not formal. Like, it's very much, you know, modern or at least 90s mm -hmm. vernacular. Like, mm -hmm. the posters and whatnot. I enjoyed this kind of, like, fusion of, of that style. Like, I think that's really, yes. really, really fun. Because you're like, ah, oh, we're not... We don't have to be... We're not adhering to any particular kind of period or um, fairy tale setting. It's clearly supposed yes. to be like, what, how could we integrate like, you know, malls or like what is quintessentially like American suburbs into the fantasy realm? And it's charming and dumb and it kind of works as this like, um, I don't know like satire of our own culture when you see it done that way i mean that's not the point Definitely. of the movie but like no but it's it's and still the, super they don't fun. take themselves seriously whatsoever oh this movie's like, not serious at all yeah 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 especially like you have the cliche of like the evil main or the evil character who's just like he's like hunched over while he's like swapping the crowns and, and like just, talks like, to his you know snake that is alive snake. like snakes are like quintessentially evil Yes. Right? At least in Judeo-Christian society. Yes. Like, like snakes have been tainted. I mean, 
anything to do with snakes is always bad. It's just bad news bears. Snakes and spiders. Yeah. Don't fuck with snakes yep. and spiders. Um, but yeah, like the fact that he's like this sort of like 90s camp villain. You know it's what I just mean? Like, awful, but it's so good. Of course I'm here. Yes. <laughs> <You're> like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it works. I mean, who doesn't love Carrie Ellis? Yep. Like, no, it's it's great. Yeah. It's just so goofy and fun. Um, so what were your likes and dislikes? I had to say that I... Um, there was like one specific scene that I thought was hilarious. And that was when the in- invitation for the coronation ball comes in. And Ella's not there to receive it. Um, so the, the stepmom gives it to Hattie. Mm-hmm. And like, you just see... Um, Mandy in the background plug her ears and walk away and I thought that was hilarious because like yep she knows exactly what's coming yeah that anyways so like just the characters and how they interact and how like I want to say memorable they all are like they all have their own personalities and it was great yeah it it feels Um, good It, it does feel good yeah and then also the simplicity of the world they didn't bother coming up with any crazy in-depth lore which most times i would be like oh come on i want to know more but also just because of the style of the movie having it called like giant town is fine it, it, yeah i think it's clearly it supposed to be like fairy tale like we go to the one village where all the wood elves live we go to giant yeah. town we go and yeah. then there's like the one kingdom like it's just it's very simplistic it's very fairy tale-esque which is entirely the aesthetic the movie is going for yes yeah. and it's just it works very well but like i said if it wasn't this type of movie i would be like well no tell me more like are there more giant towns or like tell me more i want to know but like i this one i was like no this is great yeah. this is perfect i don't need to know anymore it just yeah it feels like a fairy tale w- yeah. where you're just like and you know jack went up the beanstalk and met the giants and you're like yeah that makes sense because if it was yeah. fantasy as we know it today you'd be like well where are the giants where did they come from you know this is the problem yeah. that I have with Lord of the Rings often because people will be like, I'll be like, why is Sauron evil? Oh, well, he's a servant of Morgoth. Who the fuck is Morgoth? Where did he he's come just, from? He's just an evil dude. But, like, yeah, but that's my problem is like, I like my villains instead of just being like, that's the bad guy because I said so, you know, instead I like my yeah. villains to be like very human if they are human, yeah. but like very have personalities that lead them towards what they're doing uh better yet would be have them be tragic and and so like they're not actually like villains per se they just see the world as in a different way or something led them to um to think that way or feel that way or do those things and you're like this is good villainy like it's good Mm -hmm. not just you're the big bad guy who is the servant of evil and evil exists because yes you know like the primordial evil. I don't know. Does that mean if you kill the primordial evil, there's no more evil in the world? Like, there's a lot of metaphysical questions that come up when you do stuff like that. And I realize, like, I'm probably the only person who thinks like that. But, like, um, <laughs> the question in in this kind of fairy tale, what remains is is it's just, like, we don't have to go into depth because it's a silly moral play. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's just this is a thing and there's giants and... And this is the story about Ella of Frell and how she did some things and is super quirky and had a curse and love and wasn't that feel good. And that's all it needs to be. Mm-hmm. And I think the other the other really good thing about this is that if you, with the simplicity, you don't actually need it to just be the elves and the giants and the ogres that are, like, you could swap them out with anything else and the story would not change. Yeah, it doesn't really need need those characters uh yeah and although there's a certain like amount of stereotyping that that the movie relies upon yeah in terms of like uh, you know the the ogres eat people and the giants are giant <laughs> i don't mean like that <laughs> but like and big they're and strong, scary right? and big and strong and and the movie relies on that because it also tries to like pull those stereotypes down like slannon wants to be a um, a lawyer a lawyer right yeah. and then the one giant that he meets that becomes his love interest is is you know quite feminine right yeah um and so. i like the the joking like uh they'd like talk about the the grim brothers yeah the brothers Grimm, like clearly referencing yeah. so like like the purpose of this kind of simplified um 
idea, simplified stereotyping of species and, and characters is, you know, for the deconstructionist point that the movie makes. I mean, it doesn't mm-hmm. do it very strongly. This movie is not particularly mm-hmm. attempting a deconstruction of whatever. No. It, but it's fun. It's funny. It clearly But it like, also, you know, has it also has that yeah. in it. But Yeah. Were but there, it's good. I were like it. Are there any it. things that you like didn't like or like really did like, like big key points? The movie needed to decide if it was going to be a musical or not. Yes. Okay, so that I actually was... hate <sighs> jukebox musicals is what they're called when you take existing music instead of writing new ones i hate jukebox musicals that don't stick to one band yeah i find it like very schizophrenic i should i guess like i I find i'm all over the place like i'm very and 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 i also often wonder like how do the bands feel when their music is taken out of context Like, I often wonder, Mm -hmm. like, so the big feature in this one, in this movie, is the part where Ella sings at the giant party. She sings, Can Anybody Find Me Somebody to Love uh, by Queen. And you're like, yeah, this is a great song, but it feels different. So there's a term that Christopher Small uses. I'm going to go way deep into my... uh, No, go for it. ...my education. There's a term that Christopher Small, a scholar named Christopher Small uses, called musicking. And I've talked about it before. But, like, musicking is the context in which music is, like, made, listened to, or enjoyed. Like, all of that is part of musicking, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's not just how you make it. It's also how it's enjoyed in the context of of everything that is involved in the act of music, which is an event. Hence, the musicking, not music as as a noun, a singular, you know, point. Um, And I often wonder, like, it feels weird to me to hear Queen in this, like, fairy tale setting... And, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but I often wonder, like, am I the only one who feels weird about this? Who feels like the meaning behind the song changes based on the context it's placed in? Mm-hmm. I'll give you another example um, that's been really pissing me off lately. I really love um, Rumors by Fleetwood Mac, particularly the song. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a couple songs, but particularly the song Go Your Own Way by Fleetwood Mac. I love that album so much. I have it on vinyl twice. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And uh, like I have that that vinyl rumors twice. And recently I've been seeing car commercials for like a hundred years and they're like, and it's like a version of Go Your Own Way. And I'm like, ah, this feels like, like a, a lessening of the art. Yes. It feels like when you put it into context, like, oh, we're going to sell you a car that we've been making for a hundred years, like a hundred years of celebration of, of this company making cars. And in the background, it's like, you can't go your own way. And I get it. Go your own way. Like as in driving. I get it. It's yes. clever. It's marketing, whatever. But it's also like, eh, this feels like somehow the song itself has been sold out. Now, I know the band didn't sell out. They clearly get money from this like royalties from this but it's like did we think about how this might affect the art form itself by the context it's placed in probably Mm -hmm. not because the point was to be like oh i i recognize that song i'm gonna buy cars from this company or like yeah they're like trying to do like i want to call it like subliminal subliminal like it's not quite subliminal but but yeah it's along the same yeah if you hear the song again you might be like oh haha that's on that one car commercial and then you know think about that car again yeah right so so to bring this back to ella i feel like when you when you sing a song like this in this way the context kind of changes in terms of the musicking like the song takes on a new meaning that might be different from how you would listen to it elsewise. And I'm not just talking about death Mm -hmm. of the author. Like, I'm not just saying, of course, when you put a song out there, you no longer have control over what it means to people. That's not the point I'm making. Mm -hmm. Um, I simply think, like, have we really thought about the purpose of of music in this movie and why we use those particular songs? Yeah. I don't know. It's worth thinking about. Uh, I know how I feel about it, but I'm not going to, like, outright say that my way of thinking is right or wrong. Well, I know that I don't like the way that it was done. I would rather not have it that way. Yeah. Like I don't I don't want them to do like a half musical and I don't want them to really I don't know, it didn't seem right to have those songs in it. But again, it's the style of the movie. It's they were, you know, just having fun with it. Yeah. I'm gonna come back to this idea of musicking again in a little bit. Okay. When I talk more about something else that bothered me. 
Oh, and then also their outfits. I didn't mind their outfits. I thought they were like... I didn't. It, it was bad. <laughs> I thought they were supposed to be like, oh, these are like silly kind of in costume of the world. Like, because I, I think the idea is they're supposed to be half this 90s aesthetic, hence a lot of crop tops and t-shirts and and like bright pastel colors of the 90s mixed with yep. this fairy tale style. So we get this very uniquely, I guess, Southern California kind of pop culture way of wearing clothing mixed with fairy tale kind of yeah. aesthetic like I just thought it was like awful it's just very <laughs> 90s like it's purposefully yes. done that way it's just very 90s the, the only question that I had about because I mean like even if you look at what um Ella wears right it's it's mm-hmm. already looks like um it already looks like that, you know, long skirts and 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 uh, t-shirts that girls would wear in high school in the '90s that were popular, mm-hmm. particularly in California. I'm obviously generalizing, um, and but Hattie and and her sister and all the characters in that demographic look that way, and their hair yeah. is often done in ways that would have been popular in the '90s. Yeah, but it's it's also done like, oh, how can we make this look like fairy tale wise, right? So the belts that ella wears or the like the fact that she wears like that kind of hooded cape thing like these are i mean it's it's obviously done with some intention but it's it's Mm -hmm. it is kind of campy nothing wrong with that it's pretty it's pretty campy (laughs) i didn't like it but but why didn't you like it it just because it was too it was it was too goofy okay for an already goofy movie oh oh, that was over the top (laughs) yeah that was over the top (laughs) yeah okay all right uh yeah um uh, any other likes or dislikes Mm, no but i do kind of have like i've got a little paragraph here just like some just a random thought that i had i guess thoughts um was that like i found that they obviously were trying something new by like meshing you know the fairy tale genre with like 90s aesthetic um and i don't think they really needed to because the story itself was already fairly unique like it was a twist on cinderella obviously right but they also still had the main um the main ideas and themes like the the clocks striking at midnight the fairy godmother who gets her ready to go to the ball the crystal shoes which were not actually incorporated in a way you might think but they were still included Mm. and you know stuff like that yeah i don't know i mean would I watch this movie if, if it had taken the 90s aesthetic out but was still a comedy? Probably. I might even yeah. enjoyed it, have enjoyed it more. I'm Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So like, you, I don't think it really think, needed to mesh the aesthetics. You, I think the reason that you might think that, if I can put words in your mouth, please excuse me. But I think the reason you might <laughs> think that is because when you do when you pull the 90s aesthetic out, it it feels like this the fairy tale qualities might be a little bit more timeless. Because this movie does have some really neat ideas in the way that it flips Cinderella on its head and incorporates some new ideas. Um, but I wonder how timeless, or I wonder, I think when you put the 90s in there, like the way that we see it, it no longer is timeless. It becomes a little bit more problematic. It's harder to, uh, it, it, I guess it's harder to, well, it's always going to be rooted in the 90s is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, which is what I didn't like about it because now, you know, in, in 10 years again, when we, if someone else were to watch it, it's like, you know, it's almost 30 years old at that point and it's just going to be even more cringy or it could be, okay, so I have a student who's uh, 10 or 11 or something yeah. like that and I was talking with her one time and she's like, Alyssa, did you grow up in the 90s? And I was like, well, I was born in the 90s, but, you know, I grew up in the early 2000s. She's like, and then she started asking me about all these, like, toys and stuff that I, you know, had played with when I was young. And she's like, do you still have any? Like, can I buy some off of you? And I was like, what? Why? Whoa, They're like this, like, weird, like, 90s, like, but not nostalgia, like, almost like. Rebirth? She's like, I want them because they're retro, and I was like, don't use that word. You just hurt me. <laughs> what? Why? Like, just that's so funny. Like, yeah, I mean, well, we see these things come in waves, and fashion often comes in waves, and it, it, it things look the same. Like the like we were talking about those long skirts were big in the '90s, but then they were also really big in the '60s. 
and I am seeing a little bit of a comeback of them right now too. And and I mean like the whole idea of and I am loath to to talk about them, but the whole idea of like the Visco girl, mm-hmm. um, has a very '90s aesthetic: big sweatshirts, tie dye, scrunchies. These are all things we've seen before, and they are definitely still coming back. Exactly. So I don't know. I wonder. It, it this definitely roots it in the '90s, but it also how much does it talk? How much? How much does that really as uh, a negative in terms of the timelessness of this movie? I, yeah. I see what you're saying. I agree with you. Even, yeah. But we see okay. things come back. I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, there was a lot to like about this movie. It wasn't particularly deep until all of a sudden I was like, wait a second. I have it bolded in my notes. Um, wouldn't just anyone telling Ella, don't do what other people tell you unless you want to fix the curse. That's what I thought as well, but it might have to be, like, I don't know. No, because, like, you just, it's a you very just tell her, like, one. hey, from now until you die, I'm telling you, as an order, don't do what other people tell you unless you want to die. Uh, yeah. Sorry, unless you want to. And then all of a sudden, it's like, boom, now the curse, this whole <laughs> logic you is, die. unless you want to die, I misspoke, <laughs> unless you want to <laughs> die, um... Yeah, I'm also a little unclear as to how giants would be enslaved. Like, it appears to me that there's a bit of a power structure in terms of enslaving giants. If you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, how would one go yeah. about enslaving a giant? I don't know. Well, it seems to be... It's also a bit of a cliche in most fantasy stories, that so I don't know. enslaved? Really? Somehow. I feel like that's, okay, so... I feel like that's just not so improbable, not undoable. So so improbable, like like physical powers is obviously on the side of the giants, and and yes. enslaving something is usually usually subjugation involves some kind of overpowering, and yes, and it, when you don't have the technological when you don't have the technological means to overpower the giants, as you would in like this kind of fairy tale setting, like they don't have the technological means in this fairy tale setting. The giants clearly have like a power over. There's an imbalance well, of power. And I mean, if we fa- look at like things in real life that might be similar, like think about like elephants. Yeah, but the giants are clearly um, on the same uh, in- intellectual level as I mean, humans. So elephants, they just can't really talk to. Yeah, no. The, well, yeah. elephants, elephants have a lot of like really deep. Uh, and um complex like social and behavioral uh um developments that we actually have right we have a lot in common with elements emotionally physically not so much physically but like psychologically behaviorally socially yeah so but still you know somehow the same thing has happened with elephants but we're also much more intelligent I guess much more ability to like come up with tools and weapons and they just have well elephants can use tools but they don't communicate like vast ideas or or complex ideas the same way we do and they don't have a complex language of any sort Mm -hmm. that we do they do have language though they do and it is true then I guess it's not on our level yeah right so so in this case in this case um, the giants are seen to be on par with humans in terms of their intellect and in terms of their like sentience ergo Mm -hmm. You know, giants have the advantage over humans in this case. Yeah. I don't know. It That seemed a little weird to me. Obviously, there could be other factors. Like, maybe the giants are just peaceful by nature. And so humans took advantage of that. That's quite possible. It just... That one I think, seemed to I me, think that is kind of what happened. That seems to be Im- the implication. But to me, I was... While yeah. I was watching this, I was watching that, like, armored black knight dude whip the giant. And I was like, does anyone else see, like, why this is... Just slap weird? him. Yeah. No. The way he goes, yeah. flying into the sunset. V five fo fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> just or you know, just it's like Team Rocket blasting yeah. off again. I was also curious about the intentionality in the curse. Mm-hmm. Like, so at one point when Ella and Shar are about to kiss, he's like, he says, "Kiss me," and he's and she's mm-hmm. and, and he's like, "That wasn't an order," and she's like, "I know," but it was phrased thusly. Mm-hmm. Which makes me think, like, somehow she can understand intentionality. But also, like, but then that would also, you know, when she's having that argument with the girls and the one girl's like, bite me, like, that wasn't really an order either. That's what I'm saying. So I wonder how much of intentionality is actually involved in 
um, this this intentionality that Ella is able to read into what um, what the orders are is a little confusing because I also wonder like how much does syntax matter? How much does semantics matter? Right? Does Ella mm-hmm. actually have to understand the meaning? So when when Slannon is like, oh, do this combo move, you know, do this like. I'm not sure, uh, like, as far as I know, Ella hasn't um, actually done any martial arts. So how does mm-hmm. how does she know what those moves are? Yeah. How does she know, like, is it based off of the speaker's idea of what needs to be done? Or is it based There's... off her understanding or her ability to even do it? Because at one point in time, doesn't yeah. she, like, just stop time on, on yeah, herself? Yeah, she freezes. Yeah. So that makes me think that there's, there's a certain amount of, like, physical impossibility that she's able to pull off via yeah. the curse. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot that could be. I don't know. I wish that they had some type of like rules laid out. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think, and this is just me being me. Um, uh, but I'm a big fan of like hard rules for magic. Hence my like way over encyclopedic knowledge of how spells work in Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. But um, but the idea, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind having a. How does this work? Um, so I left mine actually up to a bit more interpretation when I did my pitch. Those are the big things for me, um, in terms of what I liked and didn't like. I made a lot of comments about like small things, but overall I enjoyed this movie except for the music. I found the music real cringy because of that musical context thing, which brings me to my last point, which I think is rather appropriate because I've already decided that this episode is going to come out the same week as the episode of Jessica Jones. On this is a thing. And what is the episode that I talk about Jessica Jones about? Because you've obviously added the episode. Uh, Oh, my God. I'm pretty sure it's just about not. Oh, my God. (laughs) It's okay. It's been a couple weeks. It's It's been a couple weeks. It's about it's literally about how Kilgrave is set up in that episode in the first Mm -hmm. episode. But it has a lot to do with consent. Yes, it does. And so. Ella's curse is literally just reverse Kilgrave. Yes. But this movie and does nothing about consent. Yeah. So like the implications of Well, they they kind of do. It's hinted at, but it, to me it's like how is this movie not about consent, particularly because Ella's a woman? Mm-hmm. Like there's so oh man, like and I realize you could take this in dark dark places as they do in Jessica Jones. But mm-hmm. but um like th- 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 just Okay, so in terms of, we talked about the context of musicking. So yep. Ella is forced to sing, and she and so she sings the Queen song. And that also means, like, she doesn't necessarily want to sing, and yep. is but is now forced to sing. So it says a certain amount of, of it's, it, it puts that song, Somebody to Love Me, in, like, a negative context because it's now being forced on her or yes. through her, I guess. So yeah, already well, and there. a lot of things you can see, like, she always asks, like, please don't, like, yeah. when she's told to go tell her friend that she never wants to see oh, her again. Oh, that's so upsetting. That was so, oh, my heart, like, oh, But in terms broke. of, I mean, I realize this is 10 years before Jessica Jones came out, but, um, yeah. but I do think, like, like, there's a lot that you could do with this movie in terms of consent, in terms of talking about that kind of or having a discourse around how specifically women are treated in terms of obedience and what's expected mm-hmm. of them and, and how they cannot um, cannot sometimes say no within the realms of society, even though they would like to and should be able to. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So to me, I was like, wow, like this is reverse Kilgrave, like anything anyone tells her specifically as opposed to any, yes. anything anyone Kilgrave tells. So... And that that changes a lot in terms of like what you could do to her in the darkest sense of consent. Yeah, so. which I think is also the f- I think as an adult watching this movie again, I'm like sitting there going, okay, like Prince Char could be like a terrible person, right? But he chose not to be. But he doesn't. He's know. like he doesn't even know, and so he ends up being like the nicest person even though you know he's the prince he could still technically tell her to do something yeah i did a lot of that within my pitch and we'll talk about how that works out in terms of layers 
Okay. Layers and, uh, and female. So, so he ends up being like more than just a nice guy. He's also like a nice prince. He's not abusing his power. Yeah, he's kind of a shitty prince, actually. I mean, he is, but <laughs> I I also address that. Don't worry. <laughs> the only, I mean, I mean, let's be clear. These characters are fairly stereotypical, even though they're archetypal. Maybe I should say not stereotypical, but even though mm-hmm. they're like are like, oh, St- Slannon is an elf who wants to be a lawyer, and and Ella is not your typical like swoony girl, and uh, and sh- and Prince I'm not Charming the is like, girl. <laughs> but like pr- none of them are particularly like three dimensional. Mm-hmm. None of the characters are. But I mean, they're still they're still kind of memorable. They're memorable, but they're not deep. Like, there's nothing deep yeah. about any of them. Even Ella, like, what's Ella's personality? She's kind of snarky, I guess. Well learned, vocal, political, or at least politically minded. Uh, so she's she the most... definitely she definitely tries to go against what people tell her to do. Well, I think that would clearly be because of yeah. The she's, circumstances so she's, she's like. In. She's stubborn so she's st- when she can be. Yeah, she's definitely countercultural, but she's also still Cinderella. Yeah. Right? Classically beautiful, downtrodden, underdog. Yep. Um, and, like, all the other characters are pretty. I mean, like, Benny and and uh, and Slannon are your, like, deuteragonists, I guess. And they're... I mean, there are points where the movie just goes like, ah, you're useless right now and just gets rid of them. Yep. Like, especially towards the end. It's just like, bye. <laughs> yeah. You're not useful anymore. And they're, but they're, they're not deep characters. None of the characters are deep in this. It's not a. No, it's not supposed it's not to supposed be. supposed to be. Yeah. Anyway, what do you got for me for a pitch? All right. So I decided to turn it into a non-musical TV show following the actual like fairy tale <laughs> format. Nice. Um because I love fairy tales and I love the outfits that they wear and to me this was just this was kind of sad. <laughs> no to wonder look at. you were so angry about the the fairy yeah, tale. Yeah, like I just love like your classic like dresses and knight's armor and you know i still got to see some of that but it wasn't great it wasn't enough for me no (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah i couldn't really come up with anything like super spectacular to change the story or to like really flip anything so i just figured that i would really draw out the heart of the story a bit more um you mean and the one that she's going to plunge the dagger into? I just into? accidentally unplugged my headphones. Hang on. The one that she's going to plunge the dagger into? Can, can you say something again for the me? The one that she's going to plunge the dagger there into? There we go. In terms of, uh, the, yeah. of the story? That no. was just me <laughs> being funny. Um, and yeah, so I figured it could stand really well on its own without the weird... 90s aesthetic and the weird music and <laughs> the music it, yes the it, 90s it, aesthetic i don't know uh but i hear you i just yeah i just figured there would be a lot more space for the other characters to grow as well um so i figured i would do like a short season kind of like the seven episodes like 40 minutes or something like that because mm-hmm. um, that just seemed like the right amount of time um so the first episode um we don't actually really see like the beginning of Ella. We just see like it's Ella and her father. Um, And they, and it starts out with them going to visit her mother's grave. Um, So we already get a little bit of backstory. It's like, okay, well we know that there's, it's just the two of them right now. So then after the visit, Ella's father is just like, Hey, I want your blessing to remarry. There's this girl or this woman that I've, um, that I've been talking to that I really like. She's got two daughters your age. I think we could all get along really well. Um, She's got money. So, you know, I'm getting too old to help out with the house or too too old to really do a whole lot of work anymore. So having um, someone with money and that, you know, we can all get along with would be really beneficial to the whole household, right? Um, And then, so he arranges for the families to meet. They, like, go out to i don't know dinner or something or they meet at the house and have tea and i yeah details and uh so they uh they they meet 
Hattie and Olive are both on their best behavior because they believe that they are going to be moving into a like struggling but relatively like old money kind of house that's bigger and nicer than what they currently live in. Um, and then, oh my goodness, I you're gonna you might have to um, help me out every once in a while because I wrote Anne like eight times in my pitch by accident because I was thinking Anne Hathaway so Ella thinks that things might not be that bad you know she's a little worried about the change but also the two girls seem relatively nice at this point um and her father seems genuinely happy and same with like um this this woman that he is interested in so the rest of the episode is basically like wedding preparations um, figuring out who's going to be where in the house and stuff like that. Um, we also see the event with the prince where he comes to visit with Edgar and they, um, you know, the, the event with the statue or whatever. And then Ella and her friend are trying to get them to realize like, hey, you need to make some changes for the, uh, the giants and the elves and whatnot and um and then that's kind of when Hattie and Oliver like oh maybe we won't like Ella <laughs> so then you know you, you start seeing a little bit more of their true selves as they're like well you know we're just here for the money and here for like a bigger house so like I guess we're just not gonna talk to you unless we have to or unless we're at home because you're a little bit of an embarrassment if you're not swooning over the prince. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. How can you not love the prince? Anyways, so sh she meets the prince. They have the little episode on the, the road, and then the episode ends there. Are um, we going with half an hour episodes or 40-minute episodes? 40 minutes. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm generalizing a lot. Yep, I don't no, know how much fine. I could actually no, no, fit no, in an no, episode. It just but... changes. It just changes in terms of like what the structure of each episode is. That's why I was curious. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the second episode, the wedding happens and it's great. We don't really see a whole lot of the wedding, but we see like more of the aftermath, everyone moving in and um, trying to figure out like exactly how they're going to live together because they haven't done that yet. They just know exactly where all the, the girls are going to be moving in and, and stuff. But anyways, um, so they start making demands of Ella early because at this point, Hattie and Oliver are like, well, we've secured the position. No point in being nice anymore. And uh, so... Uh, <laughs> Give it, I'm putting up middle fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so Hattie quickly find, figures out like, oh, she can't say no i don't know why but this is a thing and really starts to abuse it early um which we do see in the movies but i just wanted to really make use of that like more um so then arita and ella are walking through the marketplace and they're just like i can't believe that the sisters that i thought i was getting are actually like so mean and cruel hundred and bitches yeah, and they, like, they make the worst demands, and they stole my mother's locket, and, you know, she's just not having a good day, and then they run into Hattie and Olive, who are already, you know, trying to get that five-finger discount on things, and, uh, <laughs> so they're like, oh, Ella, great, hi, you can, uh, pick some of these things up for us and take them home, and she's just like, oh, please don't make me do this, right, and, but Hattie's like, nope you have to because we tell you to and because you can't say no for some reason so they know like they're like yeah, and they're using straight it. up abusing it yeah. um but like i really don't change too much of the story here they still go home and or like she still gets caught and, and has to tell a read no and yeah. ends up yeah telling a read no but then this is where i would start changing things a little bit um after the, the like heartbreaking scene where Arita is no longer Ella's friend, um, we see a discussion between Mandy and Ella, and um, they're like reminiscing because Mandy's been with them obviously like yeah. through thick and thin, and she knows um, Arita really well, and so they're like, "Oh, do you remember like when we first met?" Um, 
and I got in trouble for biting that girl, but it was worth it because I gained like a, the best friend of my whole life. And like, so we see like flashbacks. Yeah. Um, and then Ella looks to Mandy and she's just like, can you remind me again how I got the curse? Because I know you've told me before, but it, mm. you know, it's, it's foggy. So then we actually get to see again, another flashback where we, um, learn about Lucinda and the obedience thing yep. and how that really sucks. And uh, so Ella decides to go find Lucinda and that's, and, you know, takes Benny with her. I still liked having Benny. I thought that was funny. Um, and that is where episode two ends. So then moving on, we have episode three. Um, Ella is traveling through the forest and kicks the bandits' butts as per Slannon's instructions. The rest of the episode is basically the same as the story again. Um, but instead of having like that discussion with the prince and um, Slannon about the elves quite yet, I'm going to make that wait until after they see the, the giants. Um, so, and then, you know, it would also take a little bit more time because... Not everywhere is a day's horse ride away. And they also weren't on horses originally. Yeah. Like, where did all these extra horses come from? It was just very strange. I assume that was but, the princess so they would party, actually, whatever. I guess. But, you know, I would, I would make them actually, like, take a reasonable amount of time to get to the yeah. to giant town. Um, And then I would just give it a lot more time for, like, Char asks Ella about Frel and like, you know, and Ella is just her, like, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, we see a lot more of like an actual like relationship being built, but like a friendship being built mm. first. And then, you know, he's like, well, I saw you, you were like petitioning, but I didn't think there was any problems. Like, tell me more. He's actually like interested in like the political part that he didn't know about or didn't realize there was unrest about. Yeah. Um, and because you're doing a TV show, you have the time to build that relationship a bit more, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's why I wanted to do like a TV show. And then, so yeah. Was there anything I missed here? Do, 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 do. Yeah. So they finally get to the giant town. They are at the wedding. Nothing really spectacular happens except they find out that Lucinda's not there. Um, they all get maybe a little too drunk, but that's about it. And no it's singing. Just, no singing. Yeah, it's just, you know, a time for some shenanigans. And that's, it's a good time for them to like rest and be like, okay, you know, we didn't find Lucinda yet, but that's fine. The prince has access to the archives. We can go there, right? Um, so episode four starts where they are all parting with the giants. Um, and they... While on the road, they're discussing the best way to approach Edgar on the topic of the giants. And Slannon takes that opportunity to be like, hey, what about the elves too? I don't want to be an entertainer. I want to be a lawyer. Um, and Char is like, oh man, I never even thought like, you know, I could see the, the cruelty here with, with the giants, but I never even thought there could be a problem with the elves too. And so he's like, yeah, well, you know, I, I'll... I'll ask, but I don't know what the, what sort of change would come of it. And then Ella is just like, okay, well, you're literally getting crowned in like a week. Yeah, get your shit together, what the you heck? useless fuck. You should, yeah, you've like, you've just started think of, thinking about this stuff. Think about how you can change it because you're going to be king. And he's just like, oh my God, I'm going to be king. And then like for the rest of the episode, he's like, He's full of anxiety because he's like, I, you know, I knew that I was going to be crowned, but I didn't exactly fully realize. Yeah, like, the what does a king do? That. Because Edgar has been basically leading up until this point, and he hasn't really been training Char on how to mm. be a king. So now he's just like, well, you know, I'm going to have to figure these things out, and I'm going to have to think a lot more, and what's going to be good for my people? What's going to be good for, like, the kingdom? And, like, how can I make sure that there's no unrest and stuff like that? And um, so, yeah, so the, that episode, they're traveling and he's just like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Suddenly I'm like in charge of a whole country, <laughs> <laughs> whereas before I wasn't even in charge of myself. It was just Edgar, right? Yeah. 
So Which is good um, character building. Like that's hilarious. Yeah, so I actually like you know, it's kinda like a, oh my god. Oh my god. Anyways, so they get to the castle and the rest of that like plays out similarly. I will not they they I don't really want there to be a tour going on in the castle, but also for the sake of having Hattie and all of there. Yeah, then it makes sense. So I'm not going to take that out as much as I would prefer to. Um, and then, yeah, so, you know, they have the same scenes where they're chatting and then um, Edgar forces Ella to take the knife. And, and that's where the episode ends, where it's just like, Ella's just like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So it basically ends with like both of the two main characters being like, oh my God. <laughs> Um, so episode five is going to bounce a lot between, um, Char and Ella because this is like, this is like the big episode for them Mm. where they're like making a lot of decisions. So Char, we start with Char and he's, um, he's chatting with his aides or knights or confidants or whatever. Um, and he kind of reveals his plan to, um, ask Ella to marry him but he also admits that he's now like super worried about being king and do I need to also worry about you know finding a queen right away um maybe I could just ask Ella to be at the castle for a while or something and you know I'll figure it out later but I just I don't know what to do yet and I really like her and I also want to be a good king and so there's like a lot of anxiety there um and Ella, on the other hand, is now just like, oh my god, I need to go. I need to write him something to be like, hey, I'm really sorry, but I need to go find Lucinda and I will be back as soon as it's like possible and as soon as it's safe for us to meet again. Because she's like, I can't, I can't be near him right now, um, just in case. And... Um, where am I? Yeah. So we just see that she wrote the note and is headed out of the city to find Lucinda. Mm-hmm. So Char gets the note and is like super bummed. But, you know, he's like, she's a smart girl. She's There's got to be a reason for it. She wouldn't just leave on this big date for nothing. How but could also, you leave me? yeah. But also, it's kind of upsetting for him yeah. because he was really looking forward to. Um, having her there for his big event and to maybe even give him a couple tips on what he should be thinking about because obviously she has good ideas for the country, right? Or any ideas. Um, Or any ideas at all, really, yeah. So the rest of the episode is kind of focused on Char after that um, and the preparations for the crowning, but you can see that his heart's not really in it. They're tasting food, and he's like, I mean, it tastes good, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) And, like, they're trying to organize what the the hall will look like and stuff like that. And Mm. he's like, I mean, this this outfit, like, it fits. It's comfortable, I guess. But does it really make me look that good? I don't know. This certainly is clothes. Yeah, he's just, he's not having a good time. And then he confides in edgar about the letter from ella and then we start seeing edgar coming up with like backup plans Mm. yeah so um that's where the episode ends um i was also thinking it would be pretty cool to see like maybe a little montage of ella going around and asking in different places Mm. um somewhere in there but i'm not really sure yeah um so then episode six hits and Ella is just chained to a tree. We have no idea why. It just, <laughs> just opens with her chained like, to a tree. That's awesome. Yeah, and she's just like, just waiting. Yep. Hanging out. And she's, she's okay with it. She, you know, there's nothing she can do and she's fine with that. Um, that is a great slanting, opening. Like great cold yeah. open. Just like Ella chained to a tree. Just, yeah, just hanging out. And then uh, Slanding comes back, and this is where we kind of learn why she's chained to a tree. And he's just like, you know, there's, I can always unchain you. And she's like, no, please don't. I can't tell you why, but please don't. Yeah, leave me right? here. Leave me here. You know, go make sure that people are ready to act because they're, um, the prince is in danger. But I can't tell you why. But also leave me chained here, please. Yeah. <laughs> right? 
Um, and so we, the audience, obviously know why she needs to be changed there. But um, we also know that the command didn't actually say that she couldn't tell people that the prince was in danger. She just mm, couldn't, couldn't say tell what the plan them. was. Yeah. Yeah. So um, then we see a little short montage of Slandon meeting with people and being like, hey, there's a plot against the prince, which is obviously bad because he wants to change things. He wants to make life better for us. And if we make sure that he's safe, then this will happen. But if we continue to live under Edgar's rule, then Shit's on fire, our lives yo. are still just going to suck. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we see that little montage and then we jump to the prince who's dressed up and he's got the ring just in case because he's still got hope that Ella will make it back in time for the ball. Aww. Because he has made up his mind that, yes, after all, he would like to marry her because... He doesn't want to lose her just because I, he didn't, you know, take the chance. Mm. And um, so the party starts. He's obviously upset and searching the crowd the whole time being like, is, is she shown up yet? Where is she? How come she's not here? And he's like, he's just, again, his heart's not in it. <laughs> um, he's slowly turning into a very emo prince. I'm, hey, that's my favorite. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and then, um, flashback to Ella. She's still chained to the tree. She's like, yep, I'm just hanging out. And then Lucinda pops in and she's like, um, she, she tells Ella, you know, go have some fun, fall in love. And, um, you know, don't, why like how did you get yourself into this predicament like i'll give you a, a gift for free and your gift is like freedom from the tree <laughs> that rhymes Ooh, what a tree <laughs> and uh she's like no please don't oh my god this is this is awful like take back my gift you know i love it it was great but i you know there's something right now that i just cannot deal with and it's just just this one single thing that i that i can't do that I really should not do. And the obedience is, is a little bit more like a curse in this point. So she's like, you know, really trying to be like, I, I really appreciate the gift, but also please don't. <laughs> I loved it. I hated it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that episode ends as the prince sees Ella and they just kind of stare at each other for a moment. And then you see in the background, oh, Edgar is just like, classic, ho, 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 ho. classic like romantic partner staring at each other like for a long held moment while music plays that's some k-drama shit oh yeah that's what i'm going for <laughs> like i want it to be dramatic because it's fairy tales but i also want it to be a little bit better than it was in the movie well i don't know if k-drama is the right way to go it's a different kind of aesthetic i'm going for different cliches is all okay um and then yeah so the final episode starts with the room of mirrors hall they okay. are what it's a hall of mirrors oh sorry the hall of mirrors <laughs> um and it plays out the same where ella is like i can't you know you'll not you won't be obedient anymore don't be obedient anymore whatever it was that she said and it it ends with her in jail again and slannon is trying to figure out where ella went Woo! You know, it's basically the same as the movie, yeah. but for this for this part, um, he finds Benny, who's tell him who tells him everything about Edgar and the plot. And Slannon's like, "Oh my god! Like, I didn't know this was a thing that Ella was going through." Um, and she's been told to like kill the prince, and that's why she wanted me to change. So we actually get like he realizes what happened. Yeah. Um. And is just like, okay, this is a lot more serious than I thought. Um, he knew that there was a plot against the prince, but he didn't realize, like, to what extent mm -hmm. that it was... Like, she was involved you know, in how... Yeah. That she was involved and that it was Edgar that wants him dead. And, you know, so he's just like, okay, this is... I don't know if I can handle this, but I'm going to try my best for Ella because she has had she's been dealt like the worst hand out of all of this yeah. so he's like i need to i need to do something um so again not too many changes in the story where they f 
find Ella and they free her. Um, and then they go to storm the castle right before the coronation because the um, crown is poisoned, you know? Um, and they, they know that. And... Do, 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 do. So... Edgar actually reveals his hand a lot quicker. Then he does. He tells, yeah. yeah. So he actually tells his like specially trained guards to kill Ella and the Chuck. fairy tale Gestapo. Yeah, and so he's just you know immediately. Um. Char is like, oh my god, I'm like surrounded by enemies now. Ella's tried to kill me, and Edgar is trying to kill me, and what the heck is going on? And, uh, so, you know, she's still trying to convince him, like, no, it was a curse. I couldn't say no, then, you know, I broke the curse that night because of where we were, the Hall of Mirrors, and, um, like, some cheesy line about, I broke the curse because of my love for you, and then, (laughs) you know, super cheesy, and, uh, yeah, and then the regular knights are on Char's side, so it's like a huge fight. And the like, I just wanted to be a lot bigger of a fight. Like, okay, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, because the fight was great, but it was like Ella and the misfits. I call them misfits. That's not the right word. But no, like, I know what you mean. And, yeah, yeah. Um, versus, um, basically all of the people of the kingdom who are in the hall at the time. And so I just wanted to make it, like, a lot more chaotic by, yeah. like, yes, the regular knights are on Char's side, who thinks that they're also getting attacked by, like, the um, Ella's group, but also Edgar's group. And so it's, like, a big, like... Three-way, like, faction battle fight scene. Yeah, yeah, and then as soon as Char is like, oh, you are actually, like, trying to keep me safe by running away and doing all these things, like, I get it now. And then it's, like, this, like shabam this big wave of like everyone on char's side yeah taking over again um and then they ended up actually just like arresting edgar instead of him getting poisoned i kind of thought the crown thing was cheesy, hilarious it's so funny as though. cheesy as it Whoopsie. was and like as funny as it was it was super like stupid <laughs> i liked at the it same time um so you know, we actually see, like, Ella is just like, hey, don't put that crown on. There's another one. That one's poisoned. How do you poison so a crown? I don't know. It was, like, it was very strange. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, they, you know, the crowning ceremony continues. But, you know, it's even funnier because now the hall is, like, an absolute disaster. Like, all of the seating is destroyed, oh, so yeah. everyone's standing. And, like, they're like, well, the coronation needs to get done today because that's when it was scheduled. And without Edgar being the ruler, this is just, it has yeah, to be done Yeah, it has done to now. happen now. And then... um the very first thing he does, he's like, okay, I'm king. The very first thing I'd like to do. And then he, like, kneels down and proposes. Aww. And it's just cute. And they end that way. But So you stuck pretty heavily yeah. to the So the, it's just, like, a story. super cheesy thing. And like the, you've, you've, kept, you've kept it pretty... Um, you've kept it pretty close to the, like, the original story that was there. Yeah, that's what I wanted because I really liked the story that was there, but I wanted it to like expand a bit more on the side plots and the characters. And I really wanted to take out the bad musical stuff and yeah, make I sure that, that it actually that. like yeah. yeah. So, it was it it was basically the same story but told slightly more seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get it. And, um, it makes sense. You wanted to change things up. But yeah, told more seriously. Yeah. I went a very mm-hmm. different direction. I like changed a lot of what happens. Uh, if you're okay, okay. with it, I'll, I'll get into it. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so the intro- uh, introduction happens the same way with the curse slash gift given and the whole setup like Cinderella. Um So Ella is one day protesting the crown. Like, she meets her sisters and that whole thing happens. That's fine. So Ella one day is protesting the crown when Char comes to the village of of, uh, um, 
of Frell, but her sister Hattie, who has been suspecting of her of the curse, uses it basically to get rid of Ella, being like, go away. Um, so on the way home, she meets Char, who's not a bad person, but he's used to getting what he wants. And he essentially is like, like, hold on, like, stay and talk to me. But he says it that way. So it winds up being an order anyway. And although Ella doesn't want to, she has to. So she winds up, so they like basically talk. And she turns out that she's like, oh, this guy's not a bad person. He's like not a terrible person at all. He just sort of doesn't know anything about anything. Um, mm-hmm. So it, and it basically appears that his uncle is the steward. And he basically talks about like whatever his uncle says goes. So he's like, I haven't really taken an interest in politics and so once I turn 18, I'm, I've basically been talking about my talking with Edgar that I'm going to give the crown up. There's a name for that. Abdicate, I guess. But without mm-hmm. without taking it. Um, uh, so as it gets darker, Ella's like, OK, I think I want to go home now. So she's like trying to go home. Um, but she also like tells Char, she's like, look, you, you really need to think about how the laws have been used. And the way the kingdom is changing because you're the only one who can do something about it and others feel like they don't have a voice and have to do what the rule of law is so char's like yeah okay all right so he's like okay well you seem to know so much about it why don't you come to the ball and she's like no and he goes like yeah come to the ball it's in a week's time and she's like well okay i'd love to even though she doesn't want to he's like i'll be home from my tour by then and then you can come so Ella decides, she's like, look, I can't stand this curse. Like, I keep having to do things I don't want to do, like hang out with douchebag princes who are not bad people, but are just like so unaware of how privileged they are. Um, so she leaves to go find her fairy godmother so that she can get the whole curse taken away. Uh, she gets accosted with some highwaymen and she winds up, like the whole thing happens with Slannon. Uh, so then um, the two of them come upon some ogres and they're just asking for directions. It's like, yeah, we're trying to figure out where to find Lucinda. And then the prince shows up and he like saves them. And Char, he's like, I saved you from these horrible ogres. And Ella's like, no, we were simply asking for directions. Like you're, you're an idiot. And he's like, he's like mm-hmm. super put out and, and he's like, man, I can't believe I'm so unappreciated. So he's like, he's like, I think you should be, you should be grateful to me. And so now she's grateful to him. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause she has to be. So they continue on their quest and, and to, and along the way, like, Ella is basically endeavoring to be like, Shh, I'm going to show you the kingdom and, like, why you're such a... You have the privilege to do something and you choose not to. You choose to be ignorant in a lot of ways. Like, that's dumb. You're dumb. Um, yeah. So one night while talking, like, this is the night of the party or whatever, if we want to do it that way. It's clear, like, Char is smitten with Ella, but she's, like, weary of him in terms of his arrogance and ignorance. Um but she's like, I see there's a good person in you, but there's so much of the world you don't know. And so he's basically like, well, you know, I'm really in love with you. And she's like, you're a nice person, but I don't know how I feel about you yet. And so he's like, no, no, no. tell me you love me. And then she's like, OK, I love you. And he's like, see, you love me. And so she's like, I love you. And she actually does love him now because he just told her so. Um, so when they return to the castle, or sorry, yeah, where we are. So that whole thing happens. So then they return to the castle and Ella talks with, uh, with Slannon and Char goes to Edgar and, and, and when, uh, Char is talking to Edgar, he's like, I think I've changed my mind. I think I might want to take the crown up because I found this new person named Ella who I'm going to ask to marry me and is the love of my life. And we're in love now. And Edgar is like, oh, okay. All right. And Slannon, the elf is like, yo, Ella, what's this big deal? Like. Why are you so, like, angry about this whole thing? And Ella's like, okay, I don't know how I feel about him, but then he told me I had to love him, and so now I have to love him. But that wasn't my choice, right? I didn't choose this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I, maybe I could have fallen in love with him, but, like, it's confusing. So, like, it didn't happen naturally, but, like, I do love him now. I just, it feels weird because it was forced rather than chosen. I didn't fall in love. I was all of a sudden in love because I was told to be. Um, so And Slannon is like, okay, why don't you just explain this to Char? Like, if he's a good enough person. So she goes and have this has this conversation with Char, but he, like, he like listens, and he's, he, but he doesn't understand the distinction between... He's like, so you might have loved me before, but now you do love me, okay? Like, I don't see the difference. Just because I told you, 
means that he doesn't see it. And the point I want to make here, like I'm going to interrupt myself. The point I want to make here is like this sort of like ignorant masculinity in terms of how Mm -hmm. consent works. Like the way that Char is as a character, I wanted him to be not a bad person, but just so rooted in his own like stupid masculine thinking that he doesn't understand the nuance between like picking and choosing. Yeah. Um, so then Edgar is like, okay, uh, or sorry, Char is okay. But, but Edgar was like, he overheard this whole conversation about Ella having the curse and telling Char that he, that she didn't choose because of this curse. But Edgar overheard all this. So Char and his uncle talk about marrying Ella and talking about taking the throne. And Edgar is like, okay, I don't like her. And I don't think you should take the throne because, you know, you never wanted it. Why are you changing your mind? And so, and Char comes up with all these excuses and he's like, I didn't realize, but like, I have the power to change things the way Ella tells me. And then finally, Edgar is just like, no, as your father and as the current ruler, I forbid you from doing both of these things. That's an order. Mm -hmm. And Char is like, no, I don't want to listen to you. I'm going to do things my way. Like I am the heir apparent so I can make these choices. And so he like leaves his his uncle and is like, I'm not listening to you anymore. So using the knowledge he overheard earlier, Edgar sets up the same plot using Ella's curse. So she tries to run away. The same thing happens with Lucinda and Ella thinks, but Ella thinks like, she's like, okay, I have one way out. She's like, because I love Char, because he told me to, the curse will be broken if we kiss. That's classic, right? Yeah. Uh, True love's kiss. So in the hall of mirrors, he asks Ella to marry him. Um, but he phrases it like, marry me. Right? right? So she's like, okay, I guess I have to. Uh, so she's about to plunge the dagger into his heart um, when she says, kiss me. And so they do kiss, but nothing happens. And so Ella is still like, oh my God, I still have to do this. So she looks in the mirror and tells herself, don't be Im- obedient anymore unless it is by your own choice. And so the spell is negated by this own logic loop. Yeah. Um. So Ella explains that she was the curse had forced her to do it to to, to char to almost kill. But Edgar is like, no, no, no. Like, I never forced you to do anything. The curse was all a lie. And he tells Ella to do something. But because the curse is broken, she doesn't do it. Um, So she's thrown in the dungeon. So a Slannon shows up he, he, and finds char and is like, yo, you can't just make a decree about killing Ella. That's exactly like what Edgar would would do. And, and that guy was like you know, he he ordered you around. And so people shouldn't have to always do what they're told. So before Ella is decreed to die, they have a trial for her and Slannon gets to be a lawyer and proves that because the curse was broken and how the curse was broken, that Edgar was in fact the culprit. Mm -hmm. Um, So finally Char is, he's like, yo, I'm super excited to marry Ella um, after the coronation. And he, and he said, you know, he, he's like, Ella, will you marry me? And she says, no. And she says, you know, the feeling, like the only reason I was going to marry you or said yes or I was even in love with you was because all of the ways that I was ordered to by the curse. And it was never my choice. And so Char finally is like, oh, I get it. That's the same way I felt when Edgar had ordered me to do things, except I had the possibility, power, and privilege to say no. And so he's like, okay. Instead of, like, he basically is like, well, what, what can I do? I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. And so he asks Ella out on a date, just a simple date. And he's like, you are, free to, you are free to pick whatever you want to do on the date. I just want to take you out. You're even free to say no. And we zoom in on Ella's face. And then it mm-hmm. ends. So we never get her answer. Oh. But the point is, is that it's left up to her. That's why I wanted to leave it ambiguous. Yeah. Because yeah. The, 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 the answer she gives doesn't matter. The fact that she can answer is what's important. Yes. Yeah. The fact that she can choose. Yeah, I don't know. I I really like this version, actually. Like, we both didn't change a whole lot. Like, the story was still, like, basically the exact same. It's like, true, yeah. And, and mine, I, I even might have could have done it in a TV show. I think there's a good story there. It, it, clearly, I just think I wanted to go into more depth about, particularly about, like, what it means to make choices, what it means to have, like, the rule of law, and what it means... Most of what I changed actually was in, in Prince Char's character. I really wanted him to mm-hmm. to be this embodiment of like masculine ignorance. Yeah. He's not a bad person. He just doesn't understand particularly like women women in this case. Yeah. 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 Well I, I 
I don't know if I conveyed it very well, but my idea was that he was a little bit more like, yeah, do what you want, I guess, right? Like, Yeah, no, kinda... that came across. I think you wanted him to be like a little bit more flaky. Yes. Yeah. We're... And for him to actually realize like, oh my God, I'm going to have responsibility. Yeah. What the heck? So and basically like he's... any teenager. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I, I was going for much more like he's not a bad person. He just never really thought about his position of privilege as a prince and as a male. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Any last minute thoughts or stray thoughts about Ella Enchanted? Not really. I just it's a good it's a good unique story, like a unique retelling of Cinderella. And I love it. Yeah, it was a fun I time. just wish that it wasn't so <laughs> 90s. Uh, yeah. yeah. Where can people find you? <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitch um, dot TV slash Alyssa Liu A L Y S S A L O O O. Yep, and um, on Instagram where I show off my little handmade things that I do um, at Alyssa Rose Handmade. Uh, you can also find Alyssa and myself anywhere you listen to awesome music with our band Robot Philosopher. And you can also find our socials on all the other social media places. You can also find us on uh, us Cinemasters on Facebook and right here on YouTube where we have awesome new episodes of our podcast every week. New bonus casts every other Thursday and uh, video essays called This is a Thing every other other Thursday. Uh, right here on Cinemasters Ultimate Timeline. So uh, be good to each other. Peace out. Bye.